Welcome to IT Pro TV. You're watching CompTIA IT Fundamentals for Exam FC0 U61. I'm your host, Ronnie Wong, and today we're going to be taking a look at, well, querying a database. And here, of course, to help us to understand that concept a bit better is going to be, well, Mr. Don Pazette himself. Don, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me back, Ronnie. And, you know, we're basically following up from our last episode where we introduced you guys to databases, kind of what they are, how they work. We showed a few examples. In this episode, I want to switch gears just a little bit, and instead of talking about databases themselves, I want to introduce you to SQL, the, the structured or standard query language that tells people how to ask questions of a database server, how we talk to the database and get the information out of it. So we're going to be running through some of the basic commands used to communicate with the database, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, the categories of those commands, how, how the server expects to receive those questions from us. And by the end of the episode, I don't expect you to you know, be super expert database administrators, but at least have an idea of how it is that we can interact with these databases and get the information that we want. All right, so Don, where are we going to begin? How is it that we really do end up talking to the database then? You know, that's one of the first decisions we have to make, that when we go to talk to a database, there's, there's actually I mean, there's, there's a ton of different ways to do it, but there's four primary ways that people interface with a, a database. And it, it just kind of depends on... Um, what, what you're looking for, right? So the, the first example is doing manual interfaces to the database. And this means that, hey, a database is a large collection of data and the data is stored in a file somewhere. I could go and directly edit that file. I could fire open a text editor or whatever and jump in there. It's extremely inefficient. If I make a mistake, it could break the whole database. I could accidentally delete data. And usually if you're directly editing the database file, the file gets locked so other people can't get into it, right? Which really kind of defeats the whole purpose of a database. So typically, we are never directly accessing the database. It's almost always indirect. We're asking somebody else to interact with the database on our behalf, and that's usually the database server, right? So maybe it's Microsoft SQL or Oracle or something like that. We're asking it to interact with it. And it is the only thing that directly touches the database file. And that protects us. It maintains the integrity of the database and ensures things work the way that we want. So that's the first way that we can interact with the database is directly doing it. And we don't want to do that. The other three ways are indirect ways of accessing it. And the, the number one of the, the remaining three, that's a confusing sentence, but, the, <laughs> but the, the number one way that we interact with the database, just bar none, is through programmatic access. All right. In the last episode, I showed an example of Amazon. Right? I went to Amazon's website. Here, I'll, I'll just do it again. Uh, I went to Amazon, and I searched for something. Uh, actually, I, I searched for X-Files on DVD, which you can see Amazon has remembered that because they have a database that tracks my history, right? So they're, they're able to see that. Um, but you know, whatever it is that I, I want to shop for, uh, maybe I want to get married with children on DVD. We're, we're going to do all of our favorite 90s TV shows. So there we go. I just interacted with their database. Not directly, right? They'd be crazy to give me direct access <laughs> to their database. I'd just make everything cost one cent and load up my shopping cart, right? But indirectly, I talked to their web server. Their web server talked to some web application. That web application then talked to the database, right? You have this concept called tiers. Applications can operate in a single tier where the program is running right here on my computer and I interact directly with it. Or you can have a multi-tier application. And that's what we're seeing here. I'm talking to this web page, and the web page is the first tier. It's an application. But the database on the back end is the second tier, right? So the application is actually spread across two different components. And that model, they actually call it the N-tier uh, model because it could be any number. I'm talking to this web server. The web server might, in turn, talk to an application, which it's guaranteed to do because that's how it's getting things like this history is from an application server. And then it's talking to a database on the back end. There's actually three tiers. I mean, there could be 30 tiers for all that matters. For me, I, I just see a web page, and I interact with it. This is programmatic access to the database. Applications are doing it for me. This is a, a very, very common way of doing things. And the database stays safe and secure because I'm not allowed to directly touch it. So that's kind of the, the second method. There's a third method. The third method I used in the last episode to show you a database. I came in. And I used an administrative tool or a user interface. The tool that I was using is actually called the Microsoft SQL Server Enterprise Manager. And what it allows you to do is connect to a SQL database server, 
and browse through and see the databases, right? So I've got several databases stored here on the server and I can go in the database and I can find a table and I can interact with that table. I can uh, maybe view the table or edit the table. Here, I'll select the top 1000 rows and then I'll come over here and I can see the data that's stored in that table, right? I can work with it this way. Now this way is pretty close to directly accessing the database file, but I'm doing it through the server, so it's safe. If I do something crazy and wrong, the server just stops me and, and it doesn't let me do that. It gives me an error or just flags some problem versus if I directly edit and I make a mistake, the mistake is in there. Now the whole database is broken. That would be really bad, right? So if I take something like um, order ID, right? If I were to actually go and edit some of these records, when I edit a record, I'm going to have certain things that it expects to be a number, right? Like order ID is supposed to be a number. And if I come in and try and change that and set it to Bob, right? When I do that, I get an error, invalid value. I can't do it. If I directly edit, it'll let me do it. And now it's broken. But here it says, nope, that's supposed to be a 32-bit integer. Integer is a type of number. And, uh, well, uh, integers are numbers, not <laughs> a type of number. Uh, but uh, it won't let me do it. It's protecting me from myself. Now, these user interfaces, they work, but they're not very common. Your average user is never going to use this. Imagine if I wanted to shop from Amazon and I had to launch up an enterprise manager like this and pull up the database and query a table and it, 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 would, be, it would be ridiculous. They would have no sales, right? So this is a very uncommon way of interfacing with the database, but it is something you'll use as an administrator. If you become a database administrator, a DBA, this type of tool is really handy because you can get in really quick and you can see things, get visibility into what's going on. And, and actually do one-time queries and other things right here from a tool like this. So it's a, another way of getting in there and working with the database. The last method that uh, I consider a popular method for working with the database is through doing queries and reports, right? There's a lot of software out there that are report builders, software like Crystal Reports or Microsoft's Power BI, Scyf, um, any kind of dashboard or KPI software that shows you performance metrics. They're usually just queries onto a database on the back end. And I showed an example of a query in the last episode. Let me bring that one. I think I've got that one pulled up right here where uh, I did, uh, oh, actually, that's not the one from the last episode. I did this one. Show me all my employees based on their hire date. And we sorted by last name. And so here's this table that it gave me of all my employees sorted by their last name and what their hire date was, right? This is a report. And I did it by writing the query, okay? But I could have done it through some kind of graphical software, something like Microsoft Access or, or Scyf or, or whatever. They could have pulled this up and even did it in a nice pretty format, you know, with my letterhead on it or a pie chart or, or something like that. You, you can get really advanced with reporting utilities. The reporting utilities are really just talking to the database the same way we would. But they're usually asking for things much more complex. So an example of a more complex query is this one that I, I wrote before the show which is pulling up all of my salespeople. I said, give me a list of my salespeople and I want you to show me what their sales bonus was. Tell me how much bonus money they got. And I want to rank them based on their bonus. Who came in first place? Who came in second place as far as how much they got as a sales bonus? Ranking is different than just doing a regular order because with ranking, you can have a tie. People might be tied for second place or tied for fifth place. So by putting in a ranking like this, it's going to figure that out and give me who is in each place. And when I look at the report that it generates, whoops, I guess I, I sort of have to run the query first before it'll give me the report. So I'm gonna run the query, and then I get the report right down here, and see what it did is my salesperson's V writer, he came in number one. His bonus was $6,700, he is in first place. Lynn Soflius, I believe, is uh, second place. Uh, it doesn't help you with how to pronounce names. Um, and then I can see, Jay Pack came in third place, and then Pamela and Jose here tied for fourth place. So look who's in fifth place. Nobody. There was a tie for fourth. So it skips it, and then you get Michael Blythe here at sixth place, right? This was all done by the database server and generated out as a report to me, and I see this information here. That's another way to interact with it. And when you have software like the Scyf dashboard system, it's just a web page you go to, and you see this. You don't, you don't even necessarily realize there's a database behind the scene that's being queried to update that screen. You just you go to a web page and you see this report. Right? When you go to ESPN and you see all the sports scores on there, right? So uh, uh, 
uh, you know, the NHL Stanley Cup was going on. I want to see the Stanley Cup results. You see the results right there on the web page, but it's all being pulled from a database, a database that is packed full of tons of information. And it might look like high level information to me, like the game was three to two. That was the score. But when you go in the database, it doesn't just say that the score was three points. It was this person scored one point, this person scored one point, this person scored the third point. And you add them together and there's your three points, right? The detailed information is hidden away in the database. The reporting software masks that. We don't necessarily see it. So that type of a solution is a really handy thing to have. And uh, I know I mentioned like Scyph, uh, whoops, I spelled KPI wrong, which is kind of funny. Uh, with a Scyph KPI, um, what Scyph does is they let you build dashboards that look something like this, where I can see my sales numbers spread by date or funnels. I can have uh, meters, like I might have a goal where I'm trying to reach 100,000 in sales, and here it's showing me I'm at 91,000 in sales. This is all being fed from a database. So whoever pulls up this dashboard is seeing database information without directly interacting with the database, and this is wildly popular as well. So, so that was four different ways. There was direct access, which is pretty much a no-no. There's programmatic access, which is really common, and reporting access, which is very similar to what we're seeing here. And then there's user interface stuff that the sysadmins use, things like the, the SQL Server Management tool I was showing you a moment ago. Uh, those are all different ways of interacting with a database. Now, Don, what are we going to actually take a look at in using as far as languages go when we talk about this interaction? All right, now, regardless of which method we use, a programmatic, user interface, uh, reporting utilities, they're all in the background using SQL. They're all using a language to talk to the database server. And the language, it's actually not that hard to learn. When a lot of people hear uh, me talk about a language, like, oh, man, I got to learn programming. I don't want to be a programmer. Talking to a SQL server is different. In fact, most of it is, is pretty close to just plain English. You just have to know the right words to use. And when you use a tool like the tool I'm using here, it helps you because if you type the wrong thing in, it will, it'll let you know. So let, let me show you an example here. So let's say that uh, I, I want to I work with my database here. I want to create some records and, oh, shoot, it's uh, complaining at me because I haven't saved some values here. Let me just do a new query all together. All right. So I want to work with this database, okay? And I want to create uh, a database of all of the states in the United States of America. So here in the U.S., we have 50 states. I want to create a, a database that keeps track of those 50 states because who knows? Maybe we add another one. Maybe we lose one. Maybe we want to keep track of that, right? So I want to tell it that I need a table, a table that's going to store all of these states. So I'm going to start by using the command create. I want to create something, okay? And what do I want to create? I want to create a table. So I'm going to say create table, and then I need to give it a name. I'm going to call mine US states. All right, now as I'm typing, a couple of different things are happening here. The word create turned blue. The word table turned blue. That is a function of the Microsoft SQL Management Studio. It's telling me I recognize that's a command word. You typed a valid command. If it didn't turn blue, I'd be worried. Usually it would mean I made a typo, right? So if I spelled create wrong, uh, or create wrong, I spelled it create, it would just show up as black, right? It's not a command. It's got a little red squiggly underline letting me know that something is wrong, and I can come in and I can fix that. Now, when I type these, notice the commands I typed were capitalized. They don't have to be. That's a habit of mine, uh, and, and many people you'll see in textbooks where they use commands in all capitals. They don't have to be. You could come in and say, I want to create table, US states, all lowercase if you want it, or mixed case. However, it doesn't matter. The, the commands are the commands. So um, I'm just in the habit of typing them in capital so I can recognize those are commands. I'm telling you I want to create a table. Now, when you create a table, this is one of a special category of commands. There's really two different categories of commands. There's the data definition language and the data manipulation language. When I'm creating tables, when I'm building a structure, you use the data definition language, or DDL. When we're working with data, when we're inserting data, reading data, you know, getting those reports, what I was doing a moment ago, that's data manipulation language, DML. Well, when I'm in here typing, depending on which language I'm using, it's going to expect different values. When I'm doing data definition, and I tell it I want to create a table, it needs no information about the table. It's not expecting me to put data in the table. It just wants to know about the table. So I'm going to say, I want to create a table called US states. And then in that table, I want to have a couple of columns. 
I'm going to have a column called state name, and I'm going to have a column called state, whoops, state abbreviation, or I'll just say ABR, I'll abbreviate, abbreviation. And so I want the state name and the state abbreviation. That's what I want inside of there, okay? Now, when I'm storing data inside of a table, it needs to know a little bit more. See how I still have red underlines on these? And that's because it needs to know a little more. It needs to know what type of data that's going to be. Now, I'm going to talk more about data types in the next episode. But basically, it's asking, is this going to be text? Is it going to be a number? Is it binary? What, what kind of data are you going to put in there? And so I'm going to tell it here um, that uh, the state name is going to just be text up to 50 characters. So up to 50 letters is what I'm, I'm telling it. And state abbreviation, I'm going to tell it that that's going to be a set of text that's two characters, two letters, right? In the US, we abbreviate our states down to two letters. So I'm telling it that's the type of information that's going to go in there. Because the, the database server doesn't actually know what these names mean. It doesn't know what a state is. It doesn't know what an abbreviation is. It, so it, these names don't mean anything to the database server. This is the important part for the database server. It's just saying, I'm going to have up to 50 letters here, and then I'm going to have two letters here. That, that's what I'm really telling it. So when I give it that information and I run that command, I'm telling the server, could you please create this table for me? And the server goes and it builds the table. So I just built my first table. It's not very useful, it's, it's empty, right? But, but I've created the table and now it's in place and it's on the server and it's ready to be used. Now, once we've got a table, it's not gonna be useful for us until we put something into it, right? So I need to populate it. And this is where we need to switch from data definition language to data manipulation language. I need to insert some data inside of here. So now that it's created, I'm gonna come down and I'm gonna use a different command. I'm gonna say insert into. I'm inserting some data into a table that already exists. And that table is the US states table. And I'm gonna be providing the state name and the state abbreviation for for several different systems right or states and popping them in there right so i'm telling you i'm going to provide this data now with data definition language that's all you would need but data manipulation language i'm manipulating data so i need to tell it how to manipulate it and so i'm going to tell it that i have several values that i want to provide and then i'm going to give it the values i'll just uh i'll just create like three states i don't want to go too crazy because it'll be boring to watch uh we're in florida so we might as well add Florida, and that's the full name of Florida. And up here, I said the first value would be the state name. The second value is the state abbreviation. So the next thing I'm gonna do is provide that FL, which is the two letter abbreviation for Florida. And then I can go on and provide any other states that I want. So maybe I wanna do Georgia, and we'll punch that one in. And lastly, we'll do Alabama. So we'll get Alabama punched in. And if you make typos, depending on the software you use, it might actually be correcting for you and, and updating. Uh, it might not, right? It's really up to you to make sure your syntax is correct. But there's the values that I want to add into the system. And so it's got that. So I'm going to take that and I'm going to run it. And when I run it, I get three rows affected. I manipulated three rows worth of data. I have a table called US States. And now inside of that table, there should be three rows. Florida, Georgia, and Alabama, and each of them have their two-letter abbreviations all tucked right alongside them stored in that table. Now, once the data is in the table, I need to be able to get at it, right? So if I want to view the information, how, how do I know it's actually there? I'm, I'm saying it's there, but, but is it, right? I can come in and I can say select, right? Select is how we get data out of a database. The select command, by, by the way, is like the most common database command that you run. This is how we query things. We want to generate a report or something else. We're doing select statements, right? I want to select, and I'm going to use the star, which just means I want everything. Give me everything from inside of that table. So select star from, whoops, sorry, I clicked in the wrong spot. I want to select star from US states, right? I want to see everything that's in that table. Just give it to me, and let me see what's there. And so when I run that, it's gonna execute, and there's my table. I've got state name, state abbreviation, I see Florida, Georgia, Alabama, and I see their two-letter abbreviations right there. I can start to query them, and I get the data.
Now, the whole point of a database is that I'm not limited to just one question, right? Here's one question. If I punched in all 50 states, the question would be, give me a list of all 50 states, right? But I might want to change that question. I might want to say, give me all 50 states uh, alphabetized, right? And so I could come in here and I could say, select star from US states. And actually, let me, let me do this so I don't lose it all. Uh, I'm going to, whoops. Well, all right. Uh, I'll just say select star from states and I'll say order by state name, right? And let me just, I'm gonna clean my screen here a little bit, get some of the stuff out of the way. There we go. Uh, so I'm gonna select star from US states. I'm gonna order it by state name. And when I execute that, it's going to run, and now they're alphabetized. Alabama, Florida, Georgia. Maybe I decide that uh, I want this actually to be uh, alphabetized in reverse for, for whatever reason. Maybe we're going crazy. Uh, and so I can add DESC or descending to the end of it. And when I run that, now they're alphabetized in reverse order. And so we can see that. We can ask different questions based on what I want. Right? Maybe... I can't remember what's the two letter abbreviation for Georgia, right? Georgia starts with GE. So is it GE? I don't know. Maybe I want to know. So I ask this database. I know the database has all 50 states. Tell me the two letter abbreviation for Georgia. Well, I just need to frame the question in my mind. What am I asking for? I'm asking for the two letter abbreviation for Georgia. So I'm going to say select state ABR. I want the state abbreviation from US states, but I don't want the state abbreviation for every state, I just want the one for Georgia, right? So I'll say where state name equals Georgia. I know the state is called Georgia, I just don't know the two letter abbreviation. So I'm gonna ask this database that. I'm gonna say, can you just tell me, you know, save me some time from going to a dictionary or whatever, uh, and I just want to know that one. And when I run it, it's going to look in the database, it's going to find Georgia, and then it's going to give me the state abbreviation, and it's GA, right? I can now use this table more than one way. I can get a list of all 50 states. I can get a list of the states alphabetized, uh, ascending or descending. I can get the abbreviation for any individual state. I could get every state that starts with the letter G, right? Um, I have Georgia. Do any other states start with a G? That's that a bad example, look. right? So uh, uh, we got Alabama, right? So maybe if I added Arkansas or somebody, I might say, give me all of the states that start with A, right? So that would be the same kind of thing here is uh, I might say select, here, we'll, we'll just do an all new query. I'll say select star from US states where state name is like, and then I'll just say, uh, uh, let's see, is it, uh, percent a if i remember right to do the you know that it begins with the, the percent is like a variable oh, actually you know what it would be the other way around to be a percent uh like that so i'm telling it give me a list of those states where it, it follows this particular pattern if they start with a so that is a, a big deal right there to be able to query and get information the way that we want it uh gather the data put it together and uh, and, and basically see what's going on in a way that makes sense to us now, Don, since you've actually entered in data here, what if you misspelled one of these uh, state names? Uh, is there a way to change it easily, or do I have to go back and retype in everything again? Uh, yeah, you, you can update data, mo most data. There, there's certain exceptions, but for the most part, you can go in and edit things. Um, so back, uh, back here, if I just, let me get rid of all this. Uh, if we just go all the way back to kind of the beginning here, I've got this list. And let's say that it turns out Georgia isn't actually GA, but instead it's, it's GE which it's not, it is GA, but, <laughs> but if we want to change that, right? I can go back and I can edit this, right? And if I want to edit it, instead of using the insert command that I used to add the data in the first place or the select command that I used to read it, I can use the update command. The update command lets me go in and change it. And so I could come in and I could say that I wanted to do a update. Uh, or you know what, here, let me, let me just, uh, I'll add an, a new record. So I'm going to add a new record and we'll, we'll kind of fix it. So I'm going to add in, I'll add in New York, right? So New York actually has two words. And maybe I didn't put a space in between them and I changed my mind later and I do want a space in between them, right? So I can say, uh, insert into US states. And I'm going to add the state name and state abbreviation. All right, so those are two things I want to add. 
And for the values, I'm going to add in New York, and I'm going to leave the space out. And then for the abbreviation, I'll do NY like that. And once I've got that in place, I'll just run it. All right. And whoops, I got a little typo. I did an extra underscore there. So let me fix that. And now that I've got that fixed, let me rerun this line. There we go. And now when I take a look at the, uh, whoops, if I take a look at the table as a whole, I should see that I've got four entries, including New York without a space, right? So now I want to go and change that and add a space in for New York. So what I need to do is come in and tell it that I want to do an update. So I'm going to update the US states table. And I'm going to set a value to be something different than what it is right now. OK, so I'm going to come in and I'll just say that I want to set the state name equal to New York. And this time I am putting the space in there, right? So I want to change the state name to New York. And then here's the real important part. I need to say where I want to make that change. If I stopped right there with update US state set, set name equal New York, it would actually change every state to be named New York. That would be bad. So I need to come in and say where state abbreviation equals NY. I just want to take that one state and change its name so that it will now have a space in between New and York. And when I run that, it's going to go through. I get one row affected. Right. Did it work? Probably. I didn't get an error. There's at least that. <laughs> but let's go in and pull up the table again, and we'll see what it says. And when I run that, now I can see New York has been updated, and there it is. So you can easily go in. I say easily. If you, if you know the, the programming commands, you can dump them in there, change those values, and modify them. And you can even modify in bulk. So if I'm updating the prices for thousands of items in my inventory, maybe I have 10,000 items in inventory, and we decide as a company we're going to take a 1% price increase. I could increase the price of every product by 1%, and it would take one query and probably just a couple of seconds. And now I've updated thousands of products. That's really where a lot of the power comes from databases, is that ability to get in there and work with huge amounts of data very, very quickly. Now, Don, in that same vein that you were talking about, what if I just wanted to delete a product that I wasn't actually uh, going to offer anymore? Is it easily deletable, or do we have to go through a, a lot of stuff? Yeah, it, you, you can. Um, there, again, with all this stuff, there's certain exceptions. But for right. the most part, you can get in and delete anything, uh, depending on how much you want to delete, right? Maybe I want to delete a single row, or maybe I decide I want to delete the entire table, right? If you want to get rid of something, uh, it's not that hard. Deleting a, an individual record is not that, that difficult at all. If I want to get rid of New York, for example, I'm going to use the data manipulation language command to remove data, which is delete. And so I'm going to say delete. Oops, I had to spell it right. Uh, delete from US states where, and now I'm going to tell it what I want to delete. I'll say where the state abbreviation, and I'm using state abbreviation because it's shorter, it's less for me to type. Uh, I could say where the name was, New Space York, but, but this is shorter. So, um, uh, so that's what I want to delete. And if I go in and I run that, it's going to reach in there, it's going to find any row where the state name or state abbreviation is NY, and it's going to remove it. And if I go and take a look at the table now as it stands, I'll see New York is gone, right? That's data manipulation language. If I want to get rid of the whole table, though, that's a little bit different. Now we get back to the data definition language. I'm changing a database structure. So the delete command doesn't actually work there. Instead, you use another command called drop. I'm going to drop table US states. And that's going to tell the system, I want to get rid of that entire table, just wipe it out. And when I run that, it's going to go command completed successfully. The table should be gone. If I go and try and query that table, when I run that query, invalid object name, US states. US states doesn't exist anymore. I've gotten rid of that data, and now it's gone. Right. So that right there is a, a pretty good rundown of the most common commands that work with databases. Now, everything I did here was pretty simple. Right. It was a small database with three rows. But imagine having a, a massive database, a database with hundreds of tables, millions of rows, uh, you know, tons of information, complex relationships between that data, and now you can ask it questions. I mean, think about all the, the power that gives you and the ability to get that data. 
it's really impressive, and it's a uh, it's a it's a fun world to work in once you learn the ins and outs. And the queries that I ran here were all pretty short. Uh, in the business world, you'll find that there's so many different exceptions and and deviations that the queries you end up writing might be several pages long to get the real data that you want framed exactly the way that you want it. But the cool part is you save that question, and anytime you need to ask it in the future, you just load it right back up, and there it is, and you've got all your answers. Everything's output. Um, throw it up into your other systems and you can make intelligent business decisions. That's really what it's all about. All right, Don, that's a lot for us to think about as we continue to take a look at the idea of databases here. We, of course, have been talking about the querying a database and Don showed the uh, most common way that uh, we can manipulate the table uh, and uh, create information, add information, you name it. There's been a lot that we've seen here, but there's actually a lot more to go as well. So we'll take tackle some of that in another episode but Don, final words here on querying a database. Uh, hopefully, you looked at it and, and recognized that it's not as complex as it seems, right? The query language itself is pretty close to just regular English language. You know, we're just asking it questions and getting the answers. So I find that really exciting. I know some people, some of the other edutainers here uh, really hate databases. So <laughs> it, it certainly is not for everybody. But if you enjoyed it, if that looked like a lot of fun, I encourage you to check out some of our MySQL training, our Microsoft SQL training, our MariaDB training. The, those get far more into all the really advanced things that each of those products can do. The other thing is we're going to do one more episode on databases, which is going to talk a little bit more about their structures and how they're designed. I mentioned data types. Uh, a few moments ago, I was typing uh, about uh, like a 50-character field versus a two-character field. I want to talk a little more about that, and I want to explain what relationships are in, in databases. I don't think I could explain them in real life, but, uh, uh, but how, how relationships work inside of a database. Uh, and that's a, an important thing to stress because it really brings together how all this data works. So we're going to see that in the next episode. You'll definitely want to stay tuned for it. All right, Don. Well, thank you once again for helping us here. And also thank you for watching. Remember to stay tuned for the next episode right here on learning more about databases for IT Pro TV. I'm in your host, Ronnie Wong. And I'm Don Pazet. Stay tuned right here for more of the CompTIA IT Fundamentals Show. Thank you for watching IT Pro TV.